Hello, this is David Mandel, and I'm your instructor if you happen to be in CIS 279L at Portland Community College. That's uh, Linux Network Administration. Okay, in this video, I'm going to show you how to set up and configure a simple network, very simple network, in a virtual box uh, using, and since our class is using Enterprise Red Hat, um, I'm going to use CentOS, um, which is really almost identical to Enterprise Red Hat, except you have a little more freedom in licenses. Uh, actually a lot more freedom in licenses but of course since you're a member of this class you do have free licenses to uh, Red Hat Enterprise um, but I've been using CentOS anyway and um, l so let's get going um, this is part one of the video. I may end up ma making this video in a couple part, different parts. I did not label the parts part one, part two, because I don't know how it's going to work out until the end. But that's okay. Um, what I'm going to do here is, uh, first thing I want to talk about VMware just a little bit. So this, uh, part one will be a discussion of VMware. VMware is, of course, what? It, it's, I'm sorry, I often, often say VMware because I use VMware. However, in this class and in most of your courses at Portland Community College, we'll be using VirtualBox. I also use VirtualBox, but I get the, I get the words confused. So if I say VMware, I probably mean VirtualBox. Okay. Um, in, in a way, in VirtualBox or most all virtualization hardware, software, the idea is that you can run some software that will allow on your computer that will allow you to make virtual computers within your computer. And then on that virtual computer, you can load an operating system of your choice. You can do pretty much anything you want to do. Um, so. Uh, your host, com the host computer, your main computer, that could be running, um, it could be an Apple Macintosh, it could be a, um, a Linux machine, it could be a Windows machine. Uh, if it's a Linux machine, it could be running most any, yeah, lots of different distributions. Um, um, I, I'm not sure whether it could be FreeBSD or a BSD machine or not, probably a virtual box probably is not available for those. I don't know. <laughs> I'll have to try it sometime. Uh, in any case, what I normally do when, when I teach classes, when I, I do work with virtualization, is usually I make a mess of mass, I call them master distros because almost all of my machines are Linux. Um, I might have a free BSD one or something, but uh, man, I have done virtual, I used Windows virtual machines, but um, for your information, I'll be running this on a machine that happens to be running um, um, OpenSUSE Leap Edition. Um, and, but, running it on actually I've got another machine where I do virtualization using Windows so um, it, it it can be anything the um, what I normally do is I form a few machines and then I install my machines uh, of the distributions I'm most interested in using I will install those in a directory uh, that I will call my master distros. And uh, that way I install the distro and then I can make customizations to that distro so it fits my application. I will always install myself as a user using the UID that I normally use and have been using for the last 20 some years, almost 30 years now. Um, 
maybe a little over 30 years now. Um, and um, I'll probably install the software that I like to have installed. So it's likely that Emacs will be there. Um, a little program called XV that nobody in the rest of the world uses, but I do. Um, a few other things um, that are just my favorite things to have around. That way, when I make new machines as part of my project, and then I will put all of those together using a, um, there's a option up here where I can, um, I, I can group things together. Like if I highlight this and highlight this, I can go up here and there's a guy called group and I can group those together in one directory and then I can handle those as a, a group. And so I will make a group of all my master distributions and then I'll make a group for every project I'm working on. Uh, this is a group when, of with my firewall machines. Uh, this group here is the group I'm currently working on. It's the group that I'm using for this video. Um, okay. Now, and then what I do is in, instead of installing a machine down here, I'll just take my machine up here and I will clone the machine. So as an example, right here, let's, uh, since I'm using um, open, uh, since I'm using CentOS version 8, I will clone that machine. When I clone the machine, I need to give it a name. I will probably call this um, CentOS 0803 because I've already got 01 and 02. I will probably use uh, generate new Mac addresses because <coughs> I feel like that's a safe choice. I don't want to get my MAC addresses uh, screwed up. Then what I'll do is I use a linked clone. Now you can, if I'm going to use this machine year in and year out, I'll probably use a full clone because it will run faster. And that means it copies all the hard disk. It copies everything. So if my a, a virtual hard disk is 20 gigabytes, um, it will need 20 gigabytes to copy it, uh, assuming I, I use the full-sized hard disk rather than the one that grows. You get a choice there when you make a machine. Anyway, so I'll use, a, but if it's something I'm using fairly temporary, I used a link clone, which really only keeps track of the changes from the original hard drive, um, because that, it, it's slower to run, but it's, um, it uses a lot less disk space. Uh, you know, take your choice. And then, um, let me minimize myself. I'll clone that. Okay, and that gives me a clone of that here. And then I, I can move that down into Some which way I can move that down into the virtual machine, into the bot, into the directory I'm working on, and I've got a new machine down there. Then, and I can do anything I want. I can start up that machine. The other nice thing about machines is I can start the whole set of machines with one command if I want, um, or I can do it individually. Um, let's take a look at this machine. Let's look at, um, settings, oh, there, settings. Okay, Th this is under settings. I can determine what all the machine has. Okay, this machine, now most Linux distributions are today recommending that you have at least two gigabytes of RAM and um, I don't know, 10 gigabytes or something of disk space, a hard disk and um, and two C, a two core CPU. And a lot of the install programs won't work unless you have that much. That seems like an absorbent amount of memory resources to me, especially because I'm doing all of this on a little poor old laptop which 
is a little big by student standards, not huge, but it only has 16 gigabytes of RAM total and um, um, a four core processor, and which is typical of, for students. And I want to have maybe five or six machines running at once. And so that's just too many resources. So what I do is when I do the install, I do the install, um, I set it to two gigabytes of RAM and I don't know, 10, 20 gigabytes of hard drive. I might make that hard drive one of those hard drives that expands as, as the disk expands. Um, as opposed to making it with a fixed size where it eats up the whole 20 gigabytes at once. Now that depends. If it's a virtual machine I'm going to use all the time for a long time, I will make, I will make it fixed size with the 20 gigabytes of RAM or, or of a disk. But if it's a one that I'm using for a class or something, I will make it I try to shrink it as much as I can. Then after I in, do the install, I go back in here and I will turn down the amount of RAM it needs to 10 gig or to maybe one gigabyte. I could probably turn it down a lot more than that. If my machine did not have 16 gigs of RAM, I would try shrinking it to maybe 512k RAM. Um, Everything's gotten bloated in recent years. I mean, the first time I ran Linux, oh no, I ran it on a little bit bigger machine the first time I ran the Linux. But in the early days of running Linux, believe it or not, I was able to run early versions of Linux on a 386 running at 16 megahertz um, on um, with three... Um, megabytes of RAM, um, not gigabytes, <laughs> megabytes, <laughs> which, you know, at one time those were incredible machines. They, I, I believe those machines costed about $27,000 each. They had very fancy elaborate graphics systems um, by the standards of that day and age. And um, um, they were big, expensive machines. They had gotten old, and they wanted to, uh, me to see if I could find another use for them. And I put Linux up so we could use them as X terminals. And they worked great. Well, they were slow, <laughs> but they worked. Um, um, and then I might move it down to one gigabyte uh, or to one CPU instead of two CPUs. And most things. Certainly for our uses in this class, everything will run just fine on that. That That's more than sufficient. Um, well, you can't really move it down to less than one CPU. Uh, but, uh, but you get the idea. Okay. Now, the other thing I want to show you, though, is the networking. When these machines first come up, the default style networking is NADed. And I never, on my base machines, I always install one adapter, never more. Even though when I'm doing networking, I may have two, three, four adapters on the machine. Um, one or two is more likely. But now they come up as NATed by default. If we look at the diagram of what we have right now, we have a setup like this. This is the internet. This is a in my case, it's a cable modem. Could be a DSL modem uh, linked to a T1 line. I don't know. Uh, it, it's some sort of device that links to the internet. Most of these devices, well, the, the ones I have at least, the last few I've had, generally have four. Uh, they, they generally have like coaxial cable or, or DSL cable coming in from the cloud. And then they will have four RJ45 RJ RJ11 connectors that connect you to hard cabled computers or wireless access points or whatever, or switches that can connect you to a hundred more computers, or more likely eight more, uh, depending on the size of your switch. Um, of course, the switches can connect to switches, and you can make a whole tier of these. Um, 
and um, um, and sometimes they have a wireless access point. Mine has a wireless access point built into it. It has a firewall built into it. It has a router. It has a DHCP server built into it. That's typical of modern cable modem. Okay, in my case, I'm just drawing one computer here that is connected to the cable modem uh, by a hard wire or maybe by a wireless system or in my case, <laughs> It's a complicated bridge that includes both wired and wireless. So, oh no, I'm on the laptop. That's wireless only. Okay. Um, then down here we have all the virtual computers. And you can have many, many virtual computers. On a computer my size, you know, it's pressing it to run five or six at a time, but I can do that. Um, now, if you have a NATed network, they're connected like this. The um, virtual computers are connected to inside your real computer. Uh, basically, virtual box will form kind of a switch or, it, well, it will form a router, basically, uh, which includes DHCP and all sorts of things inside your machine. And then so it connects inside your machine in most almost the same way that your machine is connecting to the cable modem um, and this will have different addresses than your machine's um, address within your home network um, and these machines I believe cannot talk to one another I don't understand why um, but it is the way they chose to write virtual box they they can talk to the host computer. They can talk to the rest of the world. They can't really talk to one another. And there seems to be no way to make the rest of the world able to talk to your computer except as a response to something you, to a request you sent out. That is the default NATed networking. I wanted to show you that because that's probably not what we want to use. You can also make something called an internal network. That's where, yes, these machines are inside that blue box, but they actually don't really talk to the blue box. Well, they do have a back channel, a, a, a bridge, so that you can look at the screens on each of these machines, but they don't talk to each other for your purposes. And uh, But you could set them up, you could configure them to set to talk to one another if they're on the same internal network. And you get to choose your internal network by going over here in VirtualBox. If I chose to make this network an internal network, and then I can choose the name of the network. I can just type in the name. Um, my Groovy network. Well, that's a pretty long name. But you get the idea. Um, and then what is really required is, oops, is that every one of these machines be on, have, be on the same network. They have to have the same name. I usually call the name of this network green. Um, a lot of people call it internal. Internal is just fine. I I call it green because I use a lot of smooth wall sometimes, which is a firewall, a Linux firewall system, and green, you know, is cool. Uh, or, well, the documentation for smooth wall uses green a lot, as does the documentation for IP Fire and a number of other firewall distributions. So once you choose uh, once you type in my groovy network and and hit the carriage return, that um, VirtualBox will remember that, so it will just come up in a pop-up menu. So green comes up in the pop-up menu here, and I can choose green and I can choose that as my adapter. Um, other choices? Well, I don't know. You know what? Not adapt and not attached at all. Well, okay. Um,
host only uh, bridged a bridge uh, a net network I'm not sure what that is it's rarely used and I I read the documentation long ago I, I don't think I've ever used it in practice but bridged is a cool one bridged works like this Oh, and this can either be as uh, emulate a wireless, or it can emulate uh, an, an ETH, uh, a hard wire. I don't know. I let it. I just use the defaults. But um, going out here, bridged looks like this. In bridged, okay, these two computers are within your computer. I mean, they're just software. Uh, they're virtual computers within your computer but the networking doesn't actually while they are it the networking doesn't actually see your computer as such what it does is it skips directly to the router um, for the network just like your computer so it becomes essentially the these virtual computers here are essentially a peer to your computer so they will have new addresses on the same network as your computer so say your address of the blue box was 10.0.0.0 .0 .0 this one might be 10.0.0.13 and this one would be 10.0.0.14 whereas if we're in the natted situation the blue box has a 10.0.0.12 and these computers may have addresses like 192.168.1.1 and 192.168.1.2 so they're on different networks okay and there's bridged now what we want to do in this uh, configuration is we want to set up um, the 01 computer which I didn't number name these but the one over here we would like to set that one up as a router so as a router this will be set up like this we have an internal network going between the two computers and I could have 14 computers over here to the side they would all connect basically to um, well they connect green we call it the green network but in many ways green is a switch they would all connect um, to the green switch which connects to the um, uh, zero one computer and then the zero one computer can connect directly to the um, to the bridge um, so the zero one computer has to have two NIC network cards the others only have one network card it's possible for me to go out here to the left hand side and add more computers and call that a demilitarized zone where I could put my um, internet servers and have people allow people to come in from the cloud go down here come down here and go to those machines there in which case this machine then would need three adapters um, and that's what I do in a firewall situation okay um, going back here well in this case in in my case if I want to keep this around I'll make it uh, an internal address on green there we go um, okay that's everything I want to say about VM um, about virtual box but it really is important to remember that when you're in this class you're either wanting to have things at your virtual machines most likely you want them to be bridged or you want them to be internal um, <clears throat> unless you're just using you know I mean most of my master machines are natted and some of those I actually use to do real work 
um, the Seuss one in particular. So, you know, but that's not, I, I'm not studying networking then. Uh, okay, that is, um, I think that's uh, pretty much everything I had to say in this part. Then I'm going to go on and do part two, where we actually set up the machines. <laughs> Sorry it took so long. Okay, bye-bye.